welcome to those who are watching us from home. And uh, we, we obviously have to restrict numbers at the moment for COVID, but we just want to make this accessible to as many people as possible. So there's an online audience joining us. Um, it's really fortuitous for us that Amelia Steen, who is a photographer based in Dublin and in Mayo, has been photographing members of the Irish Defence Forces at James Deaton's Barracks so over the last you know, four to five years. Um, because this building, Evans Home, before it was an asylum established in 1818, uh, was the location for the um, military in Kilkenny. And we're really lucky to have a uh, prominent uh, Larry Scallon, recently retired, who is going to give us a history of James Stephen's Barracks and hopefully touch on some of our shared history. It's such a, a fortuitous moment for us that we can open and have this combined history with the barracks with so many people involved in defence works in Kilkenny. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome, and it's a, indeed an honour and privilege for me to be invited or asked to come and give a, a talk, lecture, talk on, on, on James Stevens' barracks, and I've listed it 1803 to 2020. So we're talking about since the barrack gate opened for soldiers, I suppose. Uh, it, it did commence in 1801. It was started, to, it, it commenced being built in 1801 for a very specific reason. But why are we talking about James Stevens Barracks? Well, it's called James Stevens Barracks, but it wasn't always its name. Its name up until 1968 was just the Barracks. It never had, it never had a name like Victoria Barracks or George Barracks or, or, or any other, say, we'll say, name associated with our pre-1922 history. Uh, it, it was only ever the Barracks on the Castlecomer Road, really. And the only, I suppose, at the start, feature associated with the barracks was a, a, a place called the Roach Pond, which existed kind of where the new cinema is now. So the Roach Pond, you'll often see that address associated with the early days of the barracks. But in uh, 1968, as a uh, 67, 68, as a commemoration event associated with the centenary of the Fenian Rising, the barracks was christened, for want of a better word, James Stevens Barracks. In the following years, it would quite often be called Stevens Barracks, because Collins Barracks is called Collins Barracks. Uh, you know, McKee Barracks is called McKee Barracks, not Dick McKee Barracks. But James Stevens Barracks would often be called St. Stevens Barracks. And he ain't no saint, really. And you could never claim him to have been a saint. But one thing he was, was the very founding member of the IRB. James Stevens founded the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which became the most successful secret society ever in Ireland, and therefore came to big prominence during the 1916 Rising. And subsequently, you know, uh, it, 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 it was instrumental in the founding of what we call our post-1922 country the free state, as it was at the time. So James Stevens is heavily forgotten everywhere except really in Kilkenny. He was born in Black Mill Street, and, and, and he's the only honour for it. Well, there's James Stevens GA Club, but James Stevens Barracks has carried that name almost for, you know, uh, since he, I, I was probably one, so over 50 years now. Uh, and I just wanted to say that at the start, just so people understand why it was called James Stevens Barracks and not so much Stevens Barracks anymore because it'll be associated with the 26th of December. So he, we, he, this is Kilkenny City in 1780. And it's, uh, so there's two barracks in the city. There's the foot barracks where we are now. And there's the horse barracks, which is where the brewery site is. So in the 1790s, that was how Kilkenny was garrisoned, because Kilkenny has always been a garrison town, or I like to call it a city, uh, uh, since way back, you know, Cromwellian times, 1640s. There's been a permanent presence of a military force in Kilkenny, therefore it's a garrison town. So that manifested itself in a foot barracks for infantry soldiers. So if you were stationed here, you went from here to Comer on foot, and back again. That was what you were called, foot soldiers. And the horse barracks, obviously, was cavalry barracks. So, so those barracks would have been heavily involved in supplying soldiers for the suppression of the 1798 rebellion. 
and they were uh, heavily reinforced by the Kilkenny militia, which existed since 1793. Uh, after an act of parliament uh, passed by King George, uh, he then allowed Catholics to become eligible to be members of the Crown forces again and to be armed. And from 1793 right up until 1798, the Kilkenny militia existed as an eight company regiment, never stationed in Kilkenny because they were used as a police force throughout the country. So the Armagh militia might be in Kilkenny to be an early form of a police force. So the whole co the process of never policing your own county goes back almost to that time in, in Kilkenny. So these two barracks were found to have been less than adequate to deal with the 1798 rebellion and the increase in troop numbers that happened after the 1798 rebellion. The Kilkenny regiment would have been involved, their light company was involved in the defence of New Ross and also the Castle Bar uh, races as it became known. The, 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 the heavy defeat that the Crown forces was inflicted on them by a giant French-Irish force in the Castle Bar area back in seven, uh, 1798. And you, you've all seen the old series uh, about the 1798 and the races, Castle Bar. It probably wasn't a route as depicted in the programme, it was probably more of a failed withdrawal. The command to withdraw was given, but because the militia had spent the previous six years being policemen in other counties, they never had an opportunity to train together to learn the drills that they needed to know. Subsequently, after 1798, a gentleman, this is just uh, the foot barracks in more detail, and you can see the lake is there, uh, St. John's Abbey is there, the college is there, even at that time, and John Street is named, and you know St. John's Bridge. Uh, so you can see, so, and the Gallows Hill, which was up kind of where John's Green is now, so that's where the Gallows was in Kilkenny for public executions. Uh, and the castle is very eminently avail visible, and St. Mary's Cathedral is also visible. So you can actually, you can recognize the whole city from this map, which is now 300 years old plus. So what did the Kilkenny militia look like? Well, they looked like this gentleman in the middle. The Kilkenny militia were the 27th regiment of militia. They had yellow facings, cuffs, collars, and a red scarlet tunic, white pants, and that's how they would have looked. This, if you go to the National Museum in Dublin, this is a Kilkenny militia bandsman's uniform, which is on public display permanently. And a bit later, the officer over here on uh, my left, you're right, uh, is actually an officer from about the 1850s when it had been redesignated as the Kilkenny Fusilier Militia. So these are the local soldiers. The band was the most important thing. The band was paid fully for by the Duke of Ormond, uh, whoever, owned it, whoever was in power in the castle or in, in situ in the castle, because the band back then was the only form of entertainment that was readily available to play music. So like the old bandstand that exists still down the river, Cal the, down the wall, the canal walk, I'm sure there were many recitals down there. Every regiment that came from the British forces into the barracks in Kilkenny, the new the barracks we'll talk about in a minute, would have brought their own band. It was a very important part of the officers particularly, but everybody, how they socialized. So this is the Kilkenny militia flag, which actually is laid up in the Barrack Museum, and if you ever want to go, that one dates from, that's about the 1850s, that one. It's not the earliest one, there are two from 1802, but you can know definitely that it's post uh, the Act of Union because the diagonal cross of St. Patrick is included in the colors. So this is the barracks. So the barracks was built, started 1801, completed 1803. This picture is from 1874 when there were some additions uh, including the garrison church was added in the 1850s and some part of the officers mess here was included in the 1850s also. But the barracks at the start was 16 and a half acres. Uh, it was positioned uh, up on Ballybuck Street uh, opposite, opposite the Roach Pond. Why? Because it was on the high ground in the city. You wouldn't think it now but when you go, if you go into the barracks if you're standing in the barracks and you're looking out on the Comer Road, there's a definite 10 foot drop. That side of the barracks was all artificially elevated in 1801, 1803 to give it a dominating uh, uh, picture of the city. 
and the perimeter wall, which is 12 foot high, has existed since that time. And just to, so the idea of Amelia and the work was that somehow the photography exhibition and work, body of work, would facilitate people in peeping over the high wall, lowering the wall to the point where people can engage with us military people. I have spent 33 years of my life working in the barracks, and for the first 20 of it was inappropriate, actually, to allow civilians local close access because we had a difficult subversive element in the country, which was dealt with post-1998, and, and it made it a lot easier for us to engage with the public. public. So now on every possible occasion, uh, within means and capabilities, it's a good idea to invite people into the barracks to see what's going on there. So this is the first image we have of the barracks. And this is 1828, and it's uh, the Welsh Fusiliers. Uh, Susan Garrett from Johnstown, uh, a girl that worked with me in the museum for a period as, a, as a, an intern, sent me this about two months ago. So this is the earliest image that we have of Stephen's barracks. And, you know, the real focal point, and you'll see it a lot in the next few slides, is the arch, the archway. That's the focal point of the barracks, really. The clock, the clock is in there since 1848, and it... It chimes away there. There's a seven-day wine on it. One of the lads did a course. Uh, he goes up, he winds it, and the clock works as good today as it did in 1847-48. However, it chimes on the hour, but the, the minute hand is five minutes slow. You know, I, I always said it, it's five minutes slow, so the lads will be a bit late going home of an evening. Do you know what I mean? It's a good thing, but it doesn't work anymore. Everybody, everybody knows. So if there's anybody knows a good horologist that could move our uh, minute hand forward five minutes, even though I'm no longer working there, I'm sure the new boss or the boss that's there would appreciate it. So this is the barracks then. So you know the best pictures we have of early, late 19th century, early 20th century comes from the Lawrence Collection. He photographed everywhere in Ireland that was worth photographing. And this is one of those pictures from the end of the barracks furthest towards the back gate. So you're nearly, you're nearly outside New Park Drive, the road that's going up past New Park. This back in the day was the artillery officer's mess, and down at the far end was the infantry officer's mess. Artillery and infantry never really got on. Two lieutenant colonels couldn't share a room to have coffee in, do you know? The artillery officers work down here, and the infantry officers work down there. You can see quite clearly the full, uh, in later pictures you'll see that this part of the tower is gone now. I don't know when or where. But, uh, so this here is A block all the way down to F block. So that's enlisted soldiers quarters, A to F block. Back in the 1820s, an infantry soldier, a private soldier, was entitled to 28 cubic feet of space. So 28 square feet on the floor. Wide enough for two planks and a little bit and long enough for his legs. It wasn't a whole lot. Uh, an inventory officer, on the other hand, was entitled to 580 square feet of floor space. So, you know, uh, I, I can talk as somewhat of an expert on the difference between ranks, because I was a private, I was a corporal, I was a sergeant, I was a lieutenant, I was a captain, and I was a commandant. So I, I can come through it. But sometimes the loneliness of command is harder to deal with than a room full of fellow soldiers, because the camaraderie in a soldier's billet is top class. Do you know, you just get on with things. And then you find yourself as an officer in a room on your own in the Lebanon saying, just I wish I could go down and talk to the lads. Do you know? It swings and roundabouts. Some people dig it, some people don't. Personally, I, I would rather be in, in, in A block there uh, with a pop belly stove with 12 lads around it trying to keep warm in the winter, which I did back in the 1980s, than in the officer's mess with central heating. But that's just, that's just it. So this here then is the artillery soldiers getting ready to leave the barracks to go to the Glen of Amal for a summer. So there's no point in getting up on your horse and cart and dragging your guns to the Glen of Amal for a week-long shoot because it'd take you a week and a half to get there. So this was them leaving and going off to do their annual range practice. This is the back of the barracks. So this is the back buildings which lead on to the back, the, the road. And this here is what we know now as IJK Block. And it was called IJK Block back in 1802 or three. Uh, and that there was the horses' stables. And the lucky soldiers, the artillery soldiers, 
got to sleep upstairs on their, over the horses. Why would that be an advantage? I'll tell you why. The heat of the horses was like central heating to a point. I wouldn't like to rely on it too much, but it was. So they had the best accommodation. Now, around the corner, which we can't see, there's a, a, a building which is half uh, sort of an, a farrier shop and half it was the artillery soldier's kitchen. And in that would wo could work up to five ladies. And they had to be the so wives of five soldiers in the artillery regiment who were allowed to get married by their CO. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's just the way it was. Back in the day, back in the 1820s, the, per, the best piece of literature to read about the army, the British army in Kilkenny from 1800 to 1870 is a thesis written by Liam Bulger from New Park Drive. It's fantastic. And Liam says in it, uh, this is how he, he, he uh, talked about uh, officers had ladies. Sergeants had wives, privates had women. That's how it was deemed back in the time. So I'm not going to tell my wife she ever was a woman. She was always a lady. So I'm not going there. But there was a big class distinction back in the 1800s, as you well know, and it was no different in the army. In, abs in actual fact, it was magnified in the, in the army, to be honest with you. So this is the barracks then. Uh, it's, a, it's, again, another one of... Uh, the Lawrence collection, which I added colour, which hasn't come out superbly here, but this is the other end of the barracks. This is the officer's mess. So that would be two officers probably glancing at a number of soldiers on the barrack square where they would have been doing their drill. Again, A to F block, officer's mess, and this is known as the White House. So the White House in the barracks is where the battalion commander has his office. Now it's known as the White House since God knows I don't know when. It was probably painted white one time and it became known as the white house it's now a sort of a sandy yellow color it's still called the white house do you know uh, it's nothing to do with the white house in america but that's what it's called and there are a number of other arches here didn't have to be built in but they were built in to make the architecture look more symmetrical so you have an arch here and down at this end you have another arch you have the main arch here and there's another arch which we might see in a minute so this is probably one of the best pictures of uh, a to F block again, nice dome on the, the clock is here, gas lighting, and even at that stage there was an attempt to put some uh, 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 trees and stuff. Every British regiment that moved into an army barracks, one thing they always sowed was a walnut tree. Why? Because in a hundred years time, some regiment would have walnut to make a stock for a rifle. They were never thinking short term here. This was thinking into the future, into the future, into the future. I'm not saying that was a walnut tree, but uh, an actual fact, we don't have walnut trees in Kikenny anymore, but there is a lovely one in the closed barracks in Clomel. And then this is just a, a, a view of the barracks from the air taken in the 70s. And, you know, we have done a lot to, to turn the barracks into something that is uniquely, uh, aesthetically nice to look and work in. So the gardens are very heavily developed now, uh, way beyond even what they were here. You can see the Irish flag flying. It now flies at the other end of the barracks. Here you can see the church. Uh, outside the church here, which is knocked down about 15 years ago, was called the schoolmaster's house. That's where the school teacher uh, lived. And when it wasn't being used as a church, it was a school for the children of the soldiers who lived around the town. Uh, and in Mary Quarters, which in this picture was probably outside here. It's now De La Salle Place. There used to be uh, a, a block of downstairs, upstairs, 20 apartment type buildings that were built in the late 1890s, start of the 20th century. And they accommodated enlisted soldiers who had married and had children. Uh, this is another one of the arches I spoke about. There's another one in here. Back in the day, this was probably a busy someday, one car. You wouldn't get, like it just shows you if you drove into the barracks any day, now you wouldn't find the parking space. But one development that's happening right now is all down here is becoming a purpose-built gymnasium. Uh, this is the, it was the Sergeant Major's house back in the day. It's now the medical aid post. It's where our doctor comes in every morning. And, and this is what Amelia got, the significance of it all. Here we were, a barracks, surrounded by a 12-foot wall, 
within which a person need never leave to live a life. You have a doctor, you have a nurse, you have a barber, you have a, you have a, you know, your, your chefs, your cooks, you have a bar, you know, I suppose the bar was kind of important, uh, and, and all the things that you needed to live. And, and, you know, back when I enlisted, there would have been a few institutionalized soldiers who probably had left, you know, industrial homes in the 50s, had become soldiers, and continued to live that industrial home life as a soldier, not because he had to, because he felt safe there in barracks dotted all around the country. And that was very normal, and thankfully, the whole uh, uh, culture has changed now, whereas people are encouraged, as soon as they're ready, to move out. So you, usually, you live in the barracks twice in your life. If, usually once, and then maybe a second time. The first time is when you're a recruit and a young soldier, so you can't afford to rent out the town, so you just live in, and you can live in and get fed for something like 50, 48 quid a week cost you for bed and board all your meals and your accommodation. And then the second time you might move back into the barracks maybe as if there was a break up at home and you might need somewhere to stay short term. And we've had all that, you know? And there but for God, the grace of God go any soldier or that, that, that might have to move back into A block. It's a bit embarrassing, but you know, at least it's a roof over your head. And, and that's kind of, in here is a very nice spot. And this part of the barracks still looks the very same as it did back in 1803 when it was finished. And that's known as the DBO yard now. And that's an area where you would, back in the day, have got all your firing, your coal, your turf, your timber, your straw, your bedding. So this was the barracks services part of the barracks, you know, where you went to, to, to get, you arrived in the gate as a recruit, you were sent over there to get a, 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 a sort of a that size piece of straw, and that you stuffed that into a sort of a, sheet like pillow and that was your on your two board wide bed and you know your 28 square feet of floor space that was your life then going forward so this is a very uh, significant part of of a consequence of the barracks being built in 1801 1803 and becoming a working barracks so these are all the registered marriages in St. John's Parish from 1813 to 1858, from British soldiers to Irish girls. So you can see, and this is only one church in the parish, in, in the city. So you can see that a, a guy would come in with, say, like, uh, I'll pick a regiment, the Northumberland Fusiliers, the 5th Regiment of Foot. Uh, I'm not sure if he would pick one that's here somewhere. Uh, so the 42nd Regiment, they were in the barracks, so we know they're in the barracks from 1813 to at least 1814 because two ladies, uh, 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 private Birmingham, I'm going to say, and the lady's surname was Smith. So, so there was, I don't know, relationships built. Because you didn't come here as a British soldier, stay two months and gone. You came and you stayed around three years. And then your, your regiment went from Kilkenny maybe to South Africa or East Indies or somewhere like that. The, the really guys, the guys who you see that engage with Kilkenny most are like the, the 28th, reg, sorry, the 24th Regiment of Foot, the South Welsh Borderers. They came back after the Zulu Wars and they were stationed in Kilkenny for three years. Imagine coming back from fighting wars in, in, in Islawanda and Rook's Drift and maybe six months later you're sitting in the parade in Kilkenny and you're saying to yourself, was I in South Africa? Like, do you know, and this is in the, you know, the, late, the latter half of the 19th century. You know, I can only dream of going to South Africa. These young soldiers were you know, sent off there in sailing ships. So this is, I suppose, a social part of, a social uh, consequence of the barracks. But that social consequence of a barracks would have been equally applicable here. Because if you go back into parish records, pre-1800, I'm sure you will find soldiers garrisoned here getting married to local girls again. So it's just part of life. You know, if you stay anywhere long enough, you're going to build relationships. And one of the reasons relationships were built is these are all the pubs that were on Barrick Street. Now, Barrick Street is a small street. Uh, it now comes from like Lenahan's pub down to uh, so the centre, right? So these are the pubs listed between John Street and Barrick Street in uh, 1824. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six public houses on Barrick Street. The first one is called The Still. 
King George III, uh, King George IV, Wellington, Highlander. I don't think they'd be very popular names today if you were to change the name of your public house in Kilkenny to King George IV, for instance. But back in the day, I'm not saying there's a co correlation or there's a, a relationship between an army barracks and public houses, but like they're for a reason, right? Uh, and I suppose the social side of it. But don't forget, the only people that were sorry to see the British leaving here in 1922 were the people supplying them with fruit, vegetables, the pub trade, you know, the social life. They felt the, 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 the massive jolt that that was to the economy here in 1922. But back then, like, uh, I suppose people just saw them as the army. There was no alternative army. It was the army. I wouldn't even call it the British army or the Crown forces or whatever. They were just an acceptable part of life. And again, this is from uh, Liam Bulger's uh, fine a thesis for his PhD. Uh, so this here is the barracks in 1899, and that's the King's Royal Rifle Corps preparing to go to fight in the Boer War, actually. So there's over a thousand soldiers there. The King's Royal Rifle Corps were, uh, there's a militia battalion of them was in, was in Carlo. It was the 8th battalion of the King's Royal Rifle Corps. But the King's Royal Rifle Corps were uh, sent he, to Kilkenny to, uh, to prepare to go to South Africa. And if you're ever lucky enough to go into the barracks in the future, you'll notice that our garrison church now is a... It was built in 18, 1899, but it's, it's, it's framed, timber framed and, and clad in galvanise. And there's still three of those existing. There used to be six or eight back in the day. Uh, when I enlisted, there was six. Uh, some of them were knocked to, 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 to build other things. Uh, and they were built to accommodate the soldiers who were getting ready to go to the Boer War. So if you think galvanised doesn't last long, I can show you buildings that are 120 years old and they're still perfect. One of them is our church. It's actually just a little bit out of picture here. Uh, that's the back gate, uh, which had an arch back in the day. Uh, and this is the White House now as we're, as we're talking about it. And as you can see, the soldiers are here. They're still in Kilkenny, but they've already been issued. This is obviously an inspection day. They've been issued with their uh, South African pith helmets, and you can see the band, like every good regiment, the band is out to one side, and these are just onlookers, locals maybe, who would come in to witness or watch the parade. This gentleman here, Lieutenant Colonel Bo Bo Bookman Riddle, uh, that's him here on his horse in the barracks, and uh, with the arch behind him. Now, who'd have thought in 1899 that he would have died on the 24th of January 1900, uh, attacking Spean Cop? Spienkopf was a famous battle in, in, a, in a South African army terms, military terms, and that man was on parade in Kilkenny, and four months later, he was dead. That's simple as that. He's commemorated by a wall plaque in St. Canis Cathedral, up very close to the altar on the left-hand side. Uh, and God knows, a large number of his soldiers died that day too, but I just hadn't time to do the research. So what, what we're talking then, so these are two gentlemen who would have definitely... The uh, uh, man on the right, left, my left, is uh, Private John Barry, uh, born in 1872. He's awarded the Victoria Cross on the 8th of January uh, 1901, posthumously. So here's a Kilkenny born man from Upper Walton Street uh, who would have enlisted in the barracks. I can't say for certain because I can't find his records, but he was a Kilkenny man who enlisted in the Royal Irish Regiment and their militia headquarters was in Kilkenny having already in 1881 became the, uh, the 5th Militia Battalion of the Royal Irish Regiment, and that's why the Royal Irish Regiment is heavily associated with the southeast of Ireland. It was the territorialised regiment in the southeast post-1881. So you had the Royal Irish in counties of Wexford, Kilkenny, Waterford, Tipperary, the Munster Fusiliers, down south, you had the Connacht Rangers, you had the Dublin Fusiliers, the Leinster Regiment, you had uh, the North Irish Horse, the South Irish Horse, uh, the Inniskillen Fusiliers, the Royal Irish Rifles and the Royal Irish Fusiliers. They were the Irish regiments post-1881. So John went off and his last living act was to disable his machine gun to prevent it falling into the hands of the Boer attackers, uh, therefore saving multitude of his comrades' life. Frederick William Hall was born in 1885. His father was the band conductor, Sergeant Major F. Hall. 
Uh, Frederick was born in pa Upper pa Patrick Street, or his house was Patrick Street. He was probably born in the barracks because his mother was obviously the wife of the, the conductor and they would have been looked after in the Barrack Hospital if they had needed. Uh, Frederick William Hall again warded a posthumous VC, having died in action on the 24th of April 1915, saving one of his comrades' lives uh, who had been overcome by a gas attack. Frederick crawled out of uh, his trench into no man's land, being a company sergeant major, uh, lifted up his soldier to try and get him back and he was shot dead by a sniper's bullet. Two Kilkenny men, both killed in action, saving their comrades' lives, both deeply associated with the barracks and 100% Kilkenny citizens. So this is uh, <coughs> February 1922, when the barracks is handed over by the British Army, officially to the Kilkenny Brigade of the IRA. The man that took over the barracks that day is a fellow called a man called Brigadier General George Dwyer. George is a coon man uh, and, and uh, uh, he led the brigade in to the barracks. Uh, the first, when the British withdrew, the Devonshire Regiment withdrew, they chopped down the flagpole, they always do that. But the lads knew what was going to happen because a fella called, uh, I'll, I'll think of his name in a minute, they, they, they had uh, uh, a poplar tree knocked down and fully made ready to become a flagpole. So that was brought in and it was plant, not planted but buried into the ground and the first tricolour was flown in the barracks uh, on the 7th of February 1927, uh, 8th of February 1922. And you know from that day on the barracks has been a permanently occupied post of the Irish Defence Forces. First as a national army, I'm going to call them, because, right, so here, the first thing is, George the Wire was pro-treaty, so the barracks never became aligned to the anti-treaty section, even though the Civil War nearly started in Kilkenny in uh, 1922, when uh, uh, anti-treaty aligned Republicans took seven locations around the city and created uh, a major uh, situation for the national army. Uh, it was resolved mostly by negotiation. The guys were taken prisoner, brought into the barracks. They were incarcerated in the church, the proper church, that became their prison and were released a few days later after they signed an agreement that they wouldn't fight again. Uh, uh, and, and then, subsequent to that, it became uh, General Prout's headquarters of the Waterford Div Division, which moved down through uh, Clonmel into Carrigan Shore and pushed the Republicans back into the you know, the knock me down mountains. In actual fact, it was one of General Prout's soldiers that fired the fatal shot that mortally wounded Liam Lynch in the knock me down mountains. So, therefore, ending the Civil War for, want of, uh, for all intents and purposes. So then, uh, so then we move into uh, our emergency time. We're very good at language in Ireland, aren't we? We can't do war, right? Because when the whole world had a Second World War, we had an emergency. We had a civil war in the north of Ireland for 30 odd years and we called them the Troubles. It's like we're not minded to be very military. And that brings me to just mention that, you know, really the defence forces within Ireland are understandably and always seen to be very subservient to the state. You will never find a soldier having an opinion of a political event, act. They won't, you won't get it. It doesn't happen. We are, we are, the, the, I was, the Defence Forces is very, uh, it's there as Ireland's insurance policy. You know, we, th that's the best way I can put it. Whatever it is we're needed, and in the last decade we've been more needed to aid to the civil authority, in other words the county council, the county manager, than we have been aid to the civil power assisting the Gardaí with armed escorts. No, we don't do that as much but we're still a very alert and aware and prepared for aiding any uh, event that happens in, in the country. So this is the emergency, and Kilkenny was, actually had more barracks during the emergency, like the barracks was obviously a barracks. Uh, Jenkinstown, if you ever walk around Jenkinstown and you notice the trenches there, they were dug in the Second World War as sort of defensive positions, like Jenkinstown was an army post. There would have been an army post in Callan, there was army posts 
in lots of parts of the county. But the thing was, like, the only, like, okay, they got, some of them got paid, but most of the guys were LDF, local defence forces, and guys that done it as a part-time or quasi-full-time. But all they really got at the end of it all was a nice, they got a medal, your emergency medal. You might find one in your house. It's, it's a, a bronze-coloured medal uh, with a red and white ribbon. Uh, lots of our ancestors were, were, were awarded them at the end of the emergency. And then, do you know, the, the, the barracks post, uh, it was 6th Brigade in, in the 1960s with a company of the 3rd Battalion, A Company, the 3rd Battalion. And then when the troubles really became uh, uh, unmanageable for a period, not unmanageable, difficult to manage, three new battalions were formed, one of them which was the 30th Battalion, which proudly had the colours of Kilkenny and the city crest within its emblem. That's the unit I enlisted, no, I enlisted as a recruit here and I was posted to the 30th Battalion where I stayed from 88 until it was disbanded in 1998 and the headquarters of the 3rd Battalion moved to Kilkenny in 1998 and it's still there today. So this is the Bloods, the 3rd Infantry Battalion. It moved from Donegal, it's the oldest infantry battalion that still exists continuously in the Defence Forces. It was never suspended, it was never disbanded. It has been there since 1923 when the Army list came out, when, there was, when we were all uh, standing orders or routine orders, whatever it was, uh, you know, created all the battalions. The 3rd Battalion then moved from Donegal eventually down to the Midlands and then it went to the Curra and it stayed in the Curra for a long number of years from the emergency period right through until 1998 when the headquarters of the 3rd Battalion moved to Kilkenny after the 30th Battalion had been disbanded as part of a major military reorganisation. So I went from wearing this badge with pride to wearing this badge with initially not so much pride but very much I'm, I'm you know. Uh, the red hand of Ulster is a very unusual symbol to see in an Irish Defence Forces uh, crest or badge, but that's the way it is. It came from northwest Donegal. Its heritage is in the badge, and we bring that heritage into the, twi heritage into the 21st century. Our modern soldiers look as good and are as good as any soldiers you'll find anywhere. Uh, these guys won the Cambrian Patrol, a big uh, competition in Wales. Uh, you can see Fionn front and centre there. He's in every picture that's worth taking. But... Uh, we come on now to a little bit of Amelia's uh, fantastic uh, collection. So these are veterans. Uh, General Mangan, Colin Mangan, whose grandmother was actually Winifred de Lucre, who was Peter de Lucre's sister. And Peter de Lucre was the second brigade commander of the Kilkenny IRA, went on to be a senator and a TD. Uh, and then looking over on the other side, you'll see, I'm very proud of that picture because my father-in-law, God rest him, John Doyle, uh, he only died uh, just over 12 months ago, last Saturday actually. Uh, John didn't live to see the collection. He was very proud of his military service. Uh, he did 23 years in the army. He wanted to leave after 21 because he couldn't because he had enlisted at 14. So he had to make up the time. He was too young to retire with a pension at 35. Do you know, it was amazing. Fine buggers. And Kevin alongside him, another veteran. John is a veteran, was a veteran, God rest him, of the Cyprus. And Kevin alongside him had been in the early trips to the Congo. And thankfully, Kevin is still hale and hearty you know so if you want to talk to a, a veteran that knows about the Naimba ambush or you know the tunnels and all these places Kevin is a living legacy to that period in Kilkenny City and here he is now immortalized in a fantastic picture and these are just uh, so I just put these up right mechanic uh, J1 or I'm going to call him he's, he's not J1 S1 works in the staff office administration but if you have no administration you've no pay have you if you've no administration guy doing the books, how are you going to know how much leave you have left? Vital cog. Vinny de Ruscio, uh, an excellent medic. Uh, our barber, uh, Private Doyle. And uh, she's going to kill me now. I can't remember our girl's name. I had it a few minutes ago in my head. That's a young soldier uh, from uh, in the army about two years now. So you can see what I love about the, uh, all of Amelia's uh, pay, pay, I'm going to call them paintings, works of art, is that even though the same wall is in the background from all, it's all completely uniquely different. It's a, it's a backdrop that just lent itself to uh, showing soldiers off in, in their natural form. Like Vinny stands like that all the time. He's a world champion kickboxer. Don't ever get in a ring with him. You know, Drew, weightlifter, 
uh, Private Oil, big into his fitness uh, as well. So, and they're all, they're, they're, they're all, Megan, that's Megan, Private Megan, something, Megan. Uh, and uh, she's big into her fitness as well. And then, you know, the crude weapons. This weapon will fire 1,500 meters in, uh, with lethal force. Now, we'll never probably fire that in live. Please, God, we won't. In, in, on, in Ireland, anyway, maybe even in defense of ourselves somewhere overseas. But all our guys are experts in what they do. And this is, this is a crude weapon. Uh, and that's, uh, this is Private Craig Wall. Private Wall's grandfather is John Doyle. So there's a legacy and connection, a, a continuation in military service that exists within Stevens Barracks, James Stevens Barracks now, into the community. Because we're not garrisoning the town, we're garrisoning in the town. We're all part of our communities. The guys are here are more likely to be, Craig is more likely to be a soccer coach with an under 12 soccer team in some part of the county, as much as he is to be a soccer player himself. Sylvie Lenan here, who's a, he was an acting sergeant major and he's overseas now in Kosovo. Sylvie's brilliant at, at uh, confidence training. So we get young guys in and before they know it, they're hanging off of hills and things. And these guys here, these are two legends, right? Uh, Colin and Mick, this is Mick, Colin. Uh, recyclers, uh, and you say, Recyclers, we have managed in the barracks, like less than like 5% of all the waste that's created in the barracks becomes waste. It's recycled. We have, we, we've won awards over the years for our recycling. And it's not because we're good at it really as individuals, because we're the same. We're not great recyclers, all of us, are we? We put the odd wrong thing in the bin, but the boys won't let it go out in the rubbish if it can be recycled. So the guys are fantastic uh, soldiers with over, 35 years service each, and they found a niche now, and they're, they're excellent at their job. So folks, I'm coming to the end. I'm after talking for a little bit longer than I thought I would. Uh, this is the barracks, resplendent as it is today. Uh, the photo's lost a little bit of its definition in being egg blow, blown up, but you can see we no longer have our nice cupola. It's gone. Somebody back in the day decided when they were renovating the the chimneys on this end, that it was okay to do them in brick. I'd love to get them rendered now so that they look like this side. That's just me. Uh, it's a Georgian building, don't forget that. Uh, we lost all our lovely sash windows. Uh, John Root brought them all off there about 20 years ago. I'd say if we cry now, we'd love to get them all back. You know what I mean? Sash windows, like they're, they're valuable beyond their actual, what they are. And uh, even inside the officer's mess, the sash windows inside still have the storm uh, close over their timber, like timber, like, like, uh, timber curtains, except they just pull out and close. They're still there for the last 220 years. So with that, folks, I'm going to say, are there any questions, please? I hope, sorry. Okay, no problem. Don't be shy now, please. Can I start off by asking about the amounts of soldiers, like historically, is it similar to what it would be now? Or OK. The, the strength of the barracks right now today is, is what, what our establishment is about 512 or 14. And we're quite up to strength. So like we would have you know, that sort of numbers in the barracks. It increased from about 10 years ago when it was 100 less, we got an extra company. So the, the standard, so in, you have a battalion. In the battalion, there's four companies, five. A, B companies, uh, uh, and you have support company, headquarter company, and then you have C, D, E, and F, e, e and F company, which are actually uh, RDF companies, reservists. But in the barracks, we'd, we would have over 500 soldiers. Historically, the British regiments would have had probably over 1,000 soldiers in, in, in each regiment. So like if you think about, there were 68 different Bridget, British regiments in the barracks between around 1803 and, and uh, 1922. So that's like 68,000 men that drifted into Kilkenny, established themselves in communities somewhat, Obviously, lots of them got married to Kilkenny ladies and, uh, and, and created. Some of them would have retired and settled. So that's why you will find some unusual surnames in Kilkenny. Soldiers settled here. And then you will find some very, maybe in South Africa or East Indies, a Kilkenny surname maybe, where you know, a woman would have brought her surname with her, maybe. 
you know, a lot of that happened back in the early part, the formative part of, you know, back at the end of the 19th century, particularly. So that just gives you, uh, you know, just a, a snapshot of strengths and that. Do you know? Sorry, did the last three you mentioned? Say again? The last three for the Lucre. Oh, Peter, yeah. yeah. Peter de Lucre. Peter de Lucre was... Uh, the head centre of the IRB in Kilkenny, he was the man that uh, recreated or re, re engaged with the IRB back around, I'm going to say, the early 20th century, 1908 ish, maybe a little later. Uh, his brother was uh, Murphy, uh, Thomas Murphy, his brother in law, Thomas Murphy, his brother, Larry de Lucre. Uh, also, another friend of his was uh, Jimmy Lawler from Friary Street. Uh, Ned Comerford from Wellington Square, all IRB. These guys were the guys that were very actively involved with the 1916 insurrection, uh, the rising in Dublin. Uh, the GHQ man that was sent to Kilkenny to, to control and lead the activities south of, we'll say, Kilkenny South was a fellow called Ginger O'Connell. And Ginger O'Connell unbeknownst really to the head IRB men at the time was more aligned with Owen McNeill and Bulmer Hobson. Therefore, he didn't really push, push the 1916 rebellion in the Kilkenny area and all the guys were arrested and deported to Fongrock, came back and then they became more actively involved because what Fongrock and the other places in Wales and Ireland, Richmond barracks allowed them was to, for the first time ever, all sit down together and to understand how they went wrong. That the 1916 Rising, for me personally, had a chance of success. We underestimate the success of the 1916 Rising. Okay, they tried to hold uh, parts of Dublin, but they did build a good cordon, if you look at it from a strategic sense, co-located almost to a location with a hospital of some description, and with interlocking arcs of fire. It's just that they didn't have enough ammunition and weapons, really. To, to push it, like the loss of the odd was astounding to the success potential of the 1916 Rising. But Peter would have came back then and led uh, the Kilkenny uh, rebuild uh, and, and uh, was very active in, in the leadership role in 1920, 1919 to 1922 in Kilkenny Brigade area. Was, was he the same one the yeah, yeah, he is. 1919 in Lincoln Jail, Peter fabricated, he adjusted the key that had been sent in in a loaf of bread. The, there was a loaf of bread baked in Kilkenny here. The foundry, there was a postcard sent home at Christmas with a drawing of a key. And in that key, that picture, was the dimensions of the key they needed. So the, the people in his foundry, the Lucre's foundry on a new building lane, was used to fabricate a key. Now there are other stories, but that's the one I like to believe. That key was put into a loaf of bread, and that loaf of bread was posted to Lincoln Jail. It got through the system, and Peter adjusted the key to facilitate and allow uh, De Valera to escape. Yeah, there's another great Kilkenny story that's nearly forgotten in time, do you know? And associated with the barracks, and that Peter would have been locked up in the barracks prison for a period of time during the 1921-1922 the, 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 the period. Yeah, yeah, Peter was a senator first, and then he was a TD, uh, and uh, unfortunately he died young. He's actually buried out in Thornback Cemetery. He's, I was, believe it or not, last week I visited the cemetery to have a look at the, the grave. He's, he's out there, and TD, senator. Yeah, Fine Gael party, uh, true and true, which is kind of a little bit unusual. I'm not saying this in a real sense, but to be in the IRB head circle, to go and be in the Fine Gael party, you wouldn't likely have been more aligned to the Republican side. I'm just saying it, but uh, uh, he wasn't and didn't. You know? Now that you've retired after several decades of working for the Defence Forces, what's the best thing you can remember now of your life uh, that whole period? Uh, I'm going to say, uh, right, that's a good question, and I haven't been asked that before, because this is the first time I've ever been addressed as Commandant Larry Scallon, retired. I've never heard it before in public. Uh, but the best, recruit training is a high point, uh, but the best feeling I ever had was coming home 
uh, from overseas probably on my second trip. Because on my first trip, I was just too awestruck by the whole thing. Because in the early days, you had no, there was no phones. You wrote aerograms, you know. And uh, I was coming home my first trip. I was young, free, single. And I was just coming home to go socialize. When I was coming home off my second trip, I was coming home to my future wife. So I suppose that's a real high point when I think about it, you know. And you travel a lot, did you? Uh, eight tours, eight tours overseas, yeah. Seven, really, uh, which I got medals for in one trip overseas was with the Nordic Battle Group, which deployed to Sweden for a period of time to train, to be ready to be used as the EU battle group for that period, standby period of six months. That was another in nice time. I was up in north of the, north, well, in the North Pole vicinity. You know, we were driving around in the snow for three or four weeks, doing a lot of work. No, it wasn't just all driving. Yeah, I have fond memories, like, and uh, the, the, the legacy is, you know, I'll always be very proud to have been a soldier. Uh, my uncle was a soldier. My grandfather was in the emergency. His uncle was a Free State soldier, and his uncle's, which would be another uncle of his, I suppose, his uncle's brother died in World War I in Flanders. So, like, I, I sort of bring a tradition that has come through a very, you know, weaving path of family, but... Uh, we have had uh, almost continuous service. We've had somebody in service in the, the Irish state every decade except the 50s in my family. So, and it's continued now by two nephews uh, and a, a third enlisting the 22nd of September and a fourth girl this time who is doing her medical on the 22nd of September. So the family tradition is strong. You know, that's it, folks. The War of Independence, yeah, well, uh, the War of Independence, I didn't recognize you with the mask on, yeah? <laughs> Liam, oh yeah. Uh, I think another person I recognize there now as well, just now. The barracks was, I suppose, the, the fulcrum between the RIC, uh, which uh, policed, policed in a military sense the country. The RIC was an armed police force. There were a gendarmerie, for want of a better word. And the RIC, in a real sense, were, you know, formed back as the Irish Constabulary back in the 1840s, got the prefix Royal as a result of putting down the Fenian Rising in the 1860s. And there were the Royal Irish Constabulary located across the road here. Langton's pub was Langton's Hotel, this end of it, Brideys. That was the RIC barracks, the main one and Parliament Street, 36 Parliament Street, was the other RIC barracks. The War of Independence started and the, the RIC became an ineffective force due to uh, the, subver su sub the subversion of them by, you know, by, by obviously good means by, from the IRA and others. Like you, they prevented the RIC from doing their job because, first of all, they, uh, they not terrorised them is the wrong word, encourage them to leave the RIC, you know, because of, uh, they were now the legal, in the terms of the IRA anyway, uh, target of the Crown Force in Ireland. And, and the army as well, but the army, see, were never as in the public, like every RIC barracks, like we'll talk about, you know, the, the big one is Huggenstown, a, a small barracks, but it was taken uh, very successfully b uh, by an IRA attack a uh, hundred years ago last March. Uh, and that then meant the RIC withdrew into larger barracks and then depended on the army a bit more to have joint patrols. But then, uh, and this was, I'm, I can't have a, I'm not a political person, but a mistake about the centenary of the RIC was that you, you have to associate the RIC special reserves with the RIC, and they were, of course, the Black and Tans, which be a colloquial name which happened after they arrived in Limerick, and then the RIC Auxiliary Division are the Auxies. So they were never part of the RIC at the start, but they have to be part of the RIC because they wore RIC cap badges, they wore RIC uniforms of sorts, their command structure was loosely RIC, the special reservists were in the RIC, definitely, and they would have had local commands, and they then would have actively worked, collaborated and joined patrols with the army. In Kilkenny, there were only a few attacks on the army, uh, and, and no fatalities in the British army 
in Kilkenny during uh, the, 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 the War of Independence. A number of soldiers died in Kilkenny of wounds, but they weren't actually, didn't receive those wounds in Kilkenny. Uh, and uh, it was definitely uh, a coordinating uh, uh, sort of, they, they became the rock that the RIC depended on for mobility, for firepower, for, for uh, immediate response to, so they could go into the hinterlands, which they had lost after the Huggenstown attack and, and the successful, you see, not every, Kilkenny is not known as a big county in relation to war of independence fatalities. But in my opinion, it's a very big county in relation to uh, uh, anti-power, you know, the, 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 the crown forces preventing them from administrating number one, because Sinn Féin won all the local elections in 1919, 1920. They governed the county council. They governed the, the city council. Uh, the only people that weren't, you know, Sinn Féin in 1920 in Kilkenny was the county manager and his staff who were appointed from Dublin Castle. Like, Dublin Castle governed Ireland, but, so, but they, lost, they lost the civic authority in, in Kilkenny and, and all over the country in 1920. And then they lost, they lost the tactical command of the county because they couldn't go outside the gate because there'd be a, a trench dug across a road that would prevent them from moving. So they had to go on to bicycles, they had to go on foot. If you're not in a car moving at 20 miles an hour, you're on a bicycle moving at 6 miles an hour or 12 miles an hour, you're an easier target. And they were frightened. You know, Oskarty, uh, Cool Bon, uh, uh, and all those different attacks you, you can mention, uh, which were set up and activated, but for those, say, six or seven active, active ambushes in Kilkenny during the period, there were hundreds of ones that were never activated because the Crown forces never came. But because you didn't have the intelligence or the, what I would call, uh, you know, the outside the box sort of uh, communications to tell you that they're left the barracks and they've gone left instead of right, you didn't have that, there was no phones. So, so uh, but Liam, that's kind of, if I've answered it in a long-winded way, the barracks function was to, to, be, to be part of, to retain their British footprint in Kilkenny, to maintain, maintain command of the county uh, and, and to uh, support the RIC in, in, in pursuing and ultimately killing as many IRA men as possible. No? The Barracks Hospital inside, uh, uh, which is now uh, functioning, NCOs, private's mess, and upstairs, it's uh, offices like uh, Sean Quinn uh, died there after, after knock and aggress. Uh, Pat Welch, who was a very famous Kilkenny uh, volunteer, was mortally wounded and spent a period of time in Kilkenny before being transferred to Fermoy, where he died on, I'm going to call it an operating table, where his leg was amputated after receiving a, a bullet wound in the leg. Uh, out in Nocturne Grass, you know, and these are all very emotive things to talk about, really, do you know, but like Tom Hennessy and, and McDermott died in the Friar Street ambush, and I can name, all, you know, all the Kilkenny men that died, and, you know, Mr. Dullard, who was a, a, pri uh, an, a corporation worker, was shot dead by a British bullet that morning on Friar Street, and he got no award from uh, the local district judge for compensation for his wife, Yet, uh, an auxiliary man who was, had his shoulders broken while driving a vehicle and crashing into a trench which was dug out down near Mullinavat got awarded thousands of pounds. And all these thousands of pounds had to be paid by the taxpayers in the county. You know, there's total, in, you see, the, the judiciary were still British. It happened then in 1921 that everybody stopped going to the judiciary because the Republican courts were better. So we even took over the courts by the end of 21. So the, so the, the real success story of it, and I'm going on, I'm going to stop now, was that we managed, the Irish, state, the Irish, the IRA managed, and Sinn Féin managed to replace an in situ British administration with their own alternative administration which became more successful than the existing administration. And that was as much about winning our war of independence than the bombs and bullets were really. Sorry, Liam, for going on. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you for the history of this building and our connection to such an excellent overview of the history of the barracks and the military in Ireland over the last well, 200 plus years. So thank you so much. It's been really excellent. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. And just to say, this is the first of four talks in this series associated with the media scene that's written blood. So the next talk, I'm going to have to um, go on my phone to look at it. warriors, diplomats and scholars, so just kind of the various um, lives that people have within the Defence Forces. Uh, the 30th of September, again the lunchtime talk, 1pm, Lieutenant Paul Murphy is going to speak on soldiers and sports people, the contribution of Ireland's military sport in great, so that promises again to be an interesting insight. And then uh, finally on the 8th of October at 6.30, another evening talk, Congressman Daniel Iotis, who is from the military archives, is going to give an overview of the development of the archives from 1924 to present. Now that's actually booked up, but we will be live streaming again, so if, uh, if you haven't got a ticket for that, it will be online. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks very much, everybody.